Welcome back to the knowledge clip. This one is about chapter 5, the war for talent, and I'm going to talk about economic theories of attraction and retention. Economists take a rather simplistic view on people, if I may say so. The main idea about economic theories for people and organizations is that they're motivated by money. The homo economicus is a, is a person that strives for maximum profit with the least possible inputs, least possible efforts. In the war for talent, this leads us to thinking about what wages do to the attraction and retention of talent. There are a couple of theories that are used a lot in this context, and you'll see that these can be used to estimate what kind of wages organizations should pay in order to attract the people they need in the organization and in order to keep them as well. I'll start with the, with the classic one, Adam Smith and the, class, the classic wage theory. Uh, I'll move on to neoclassic wage theory, and then I'll talk about efficiency wage theory, and finally I'll talk about internal labor markets, and that is closely related to transaction cost theory. So let's start. Like I said, the econo economist's view on labor is that money explains mostly why people come to work. For the employee perspective, this means that if they, if for their highest value is their free time. But if you want to really enjoy your free time, you need, to, you need some income, some money. Um, as a rational being, as a homo economicus, employees will consider which efforts will bring them the highest rewards. And then they will estimate in which circumstances or with which jobs they will have to do the least in order to make the biggest money. Um, so this theory assumes that employees are rational decision makers, that money plays a big important role in there. And employers have the same kind of logic. So they need labor in order to make uh, their companies thrive and to make the products they want to produce. Uh, and at the same time, they don't want to pay very high wages because that costs a lot of money and they want to keep production costs as low, low as possible. So in this rational, rational world, labor is a commodity. Uh, it's a good, something that organizations need in order to produce the products that they want to do. And the price for this product is a wage. So wage is literally the price for labor in or for organizations in order to reach their targets. Wages are perceived as the result of a supply and demand if in, the, in a market. And the labor market is like any market, a market where employees uh, are in that supply labor and where employers are and they are looking for labor. So they are the, the, the demanding party. The very first ideas about this labor market and the supply and demand of wages dates back to Adam Smith and the invisible hand. So the, the key idea of this free market theory is that the economy is always in some kind of a balance between uh, demand and supply. And the same is true for the labor market. The idea is that if the wages go up, then more people will be inclined to give up some of their free time and start working for a job, for a living. So the, if the wages increase, also the supply of labor will increase. At the same time, if the wages increase, products become more expensive. If products become more expensive, then the general public will buy less of those products because at some point they become too expensive. Then the demand for labor also reduces because the organizations need less laborers to make, uh, to make less products. The result of this, uh, of this interaction is an equilibrium. So a place on the demand and supply uh, lines where they cross, and that is where the equilibrium wage uh, exists. So this is the price that organizations have to pay to laborers to make sure that they have all the people they need to uh, produce the products they want to produce, and at the same time there is no unemployment because everybody who wants to work has a job. So there's a perfect balance between the demand and supply of labor. So there are a lot of assumptions behind this model. First and foremost, uh, it assumes that everybody knows everything. So they're a rational decision maker. So it supposes that there's a complete transparency that employees know all about all the 
uh, salaries in all the other organizations. It uh, uh, assumes that uh, workers are perfectly mobile, that they can just hop from one uh, job to the next. Um, it also assumes that, uh, that employers can just easily adjust the wages. So if it becomes too expensive, they can just drop the wages again and that there is no government or whatsoever. So in a free market economy, the interference of governments is really, really low. Well, by expli explicating these kinds of things, you can already assume that this is kind of a theoretical play. The real, real world is rather different. However, classical wage theory is still dominant in a lot of economic thinking. However, in the newer versions of the theory, the neoclassic wage theory, there is much more attention for all the so-called frictions that happen in the labor market. So frictions have to do with that there is no complete transparency, that there is no complete uh, information to everyone. So just to scroll over a few of these assumptions that lead to frictions in the labor market. So first, there is uh, an imperfect labor supply, where within the classical which theory is simply assumed that everybody could do all the jobs. Well, that's of course not true. There are specialists, there are people that have uh, education for a specific kind of job, and there are, like, I, like we talked about in the previous clip, there are mismatches between what is offered by employees and what is needed in organizations. So there's not a perfect labor supply at all times. Also, there's an information asymmetry. Asymmetry means that the different parties, and in this case employers and employees, they have different information about what is actually the state of the demand and supply of labor. An individual em employee can very difficultly, has very much problems to, to determine what all the other organizations are doing. So what is a fair wage for the, for the, for the, uh, for the job that he's, he or she is interested in? So this information asymmetry leads to people either accepting uh, too low wages or uh, at the same time also organizations offering too high wages, for example. Um, also the assumption that workers are perfectly mobile so that they will easily go to another employer once they are not satisfied. This is of course not true. People are loyal to organizations, but they also have work and families and they, they live in a certain area and they, do not, they are not always willing to just hop to another job when there is a few cents more, more to earn in that job. Finally, there's a, a term that is specific to this theory that's called a monopsomy. And a monopsomy means that there's a limited amount of choice. So it imposes from externally the, the uh, limits to the choice that either employers or employees have to the, the jobs they accept or the salaries that they can pay. So for example, in a small village where there's only one employer and the people are, you know, it's hours of travel away to, to find another a village where they could work, then this employer has a lot of power to determine the wages and they, uh, this employer can go below the market average and still the, 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 the people living in this small village, they will still come to this employer because there is no real alternative. So that's uh, a monopsomy for the price of labor for employees. For employers at the same time, there's also a monopsomy that is caused by, for example, the minimum wage. So the government says, so this is the minimum wage that we think is fair for work. And that means that employers can't go lower than this, uh, um, than this minimum wage. So what is all, why, why are all these things important? So the key thing is, is that they hinder Adam Smith's idea of the perfect free market when there's continuous... Um, yeah, up and down in, the, in wages to, to make the, the maximum out of the free market, so to, to come to this equilibrium. So frictions, they obstruct the realization of an equilibrium. So wages can be too high as, as compared to what the ideal would be. So what happens if wages are too high as compared to the average wage as according to the free market uh, logic? Well, that is that high wages, remember, they attract workers to come to work, so they are willing to give up their spare time, their free time, and to earn a bit more money. And that means that there is a, an imbalance between the amount of people that want to have a job and the amount of jobs that are offered in the labor market. 
So that means that there is unemployment. And un unemployment in this perspective means that there are more people who want to have a job as compared to the job openings who are there. So bottom line, according to neoclassic wage theory, all these obstructions that disturb the equilibrium lead to eventually unemployment. Like said, uh, the minimum wage is an example. Um, modern, th modern economists try to use these kind of models to predict, for example, what will happen to unemployment when, once they use the wage instruments and say, OK, everybody should earn more, or everybody should earn less. Uh, and also to understand what kind of government interventions, for example, uh, improve the demand and supply of labor. So they model in all these frictions into uh, sophisticated uh, models to predict how the development of wages will affect uh, the economy and the unemployment as well. For organizations and for human resource management, this theory is quite abstract. It has no immediate practical applica uh, application. However, the, the logic behind it comes back in theories about wage setting and in theories about remuneration. And I'm going to dive into two of those theories in more detail, and you'll see the practical value of this uh, the economic thinking for human resource management as well. So moving on to the next theory, I'm going to talk about the efficiency wage theory. Well, the efficiency wage theory was developed by Shapiro and Stiglitz already in 1984. And they started thinking of what these frictions and unemployment could mean for individual organizations. And they reasoned that uh, the fear of being unemployed, in a way, is a source of motivation that can help organizations to be more effective. In essence, if you have the right, the right uh, talent pool, the right human capital, organizations are able to better perform. Shapiri, Shapiro and Stiglitz, Stiglitz, they reason with wages. So what do wages do to, to, uh, to end up with the right talent pool in your organization? So their logic goes as follows. Um, remember the frictions in the labor market and remember the existence of unemployment. If an organization decides to pay higher wages than the equilibrium that would have been perfect according to the, you know, the demand and supply model of the, free labor of the free market, then this organization is actually, according to these theories, a stupid actor because higher wages lead to higher costs of production and therefore they are in a disadvantage as compared to, the, to competitions that all pay the average wage to their employees. However, Stiglitz and Sapir say there's benefits in paying more than your competition. As a first example, it brings a selection advantage. So if you have higher wages in your organization, then employees or uh, workers looking for jobs will be attracted to your organization and you'll have a selection advantage because the more people apply to jobs in your organization, the better you can select the best employees into your organization. So higher wages, the first effect is that you are able to select better candidates. And remember human capital, if you have better candidates, you'll have better performance in return. The second example or the second reason they, they give why higher wages are effective, is that employees, they really value this high uh, wage and therefore they probably are less inclined to leave the organization. They want to stay there uh, because other employers don't pay better wages. Um, and therefore, uh, you, also, you, you also save costs, so that means you have to do less hiring. Hiring is expensive. You have to put time and effort to find better employees endless training. And also from the previous chapters about human capital and knowledge, you know that having a workforce that is experienced and that knows each other is, has a better quality in terms of, uh, of working together and, and producing a good output. So there's uh, an advantage in um, 
high wages because the employees want to stay. And finally, there is a motivation aspect, as they reason. Um, so it will lead to increased productivity because employees are motivated by their high salaries. An interesting tweak to the theory as compared to social exchange theory that we discussed before is that this theory is not so much about a willingness to do good, but rather a fear to lose your job if you don't work hard enough. So um, employees will show increased productivity because they fear that if they don't work hard enough, they will lose their precious job with this high salary. So efficiency wage theory is an economic theory that predicts that organizations who pay higher wages are better off than organizations who pay the market price for, uh, for their employees because it will have all, all kinds of productivity advantages. So there are economic gains from paying high wages. So I already mentioned this mo motivation aspect. The word that comes with it is shirking, and I'm going to explicate a little bit more here. So shirking is how the economics think how people can be motivated. And you see that there is a little bit of fear in this reasoning. So how to motivate an employee, a homo economicus, who is there to get the largest profit out of the least of, of, uh, of efforts? <laughs> well, the reasoning is that if you pay an average salary, employees will also show average effort. So that's what they are worth, that's what the organization expects. High wages, like I said, they cause a friction. As a consequence, there's unemployment in the labor market, and unemployment is a fearful situation. No person who wants to work wants to be unemployed. So in order to prevent unemployment, employees are motivated to work harder, to put more effort, to make sure that they live up this higher wage. So in the reasoning of Shapiro and Stiglitz, higher wages lead to higher effort, not because they are motivating as such, but because they make employees aware that they should work harder in order to keep their jobs. Right. So let's have a, a quick look at some implications for human resource management. Of course, when we talk about wages, it's all about compensation levels. So if you talk about compensation, you talk about your salary, but also other kinds of reimbursements, company car, holidays. So compensation, the definition is that it's a package deal. It's a package of all the rewards that are offered to employees. That can include, like I said, the base salary, bonus, vacation days, and so on, and so on, and so on. It's a, it's a total. In the literature, you'll also come across this concept of total rewards. And uh, in some literature, that's even beyond the monetary part. This also includes an, having a nice supervisor, uh, uh, all the more social aspects of work. But here, yep, if we're talking econo economic theories, let's see compensation as the total monetary package of rewards that is offered to employees in return for their work. So can you use it as an instrument to acquire talent? Well, of course, yes. So companies that offer excellent compensation, they are known in the market. Um, uh, also, there's some research indicating that companies who do offer excellent com monetary compensation, they are the better performing organizations. So there's evidence for paying higher wages than your comp competition. Another thing is that uh, organizations can invest in doing some benchmarking with other organizations to understand how competitive exactly their compensation packages are. So benchmarking is an important tool for human resource management to understand if the compensation offered by the organization is still competitive in the broader labor market. So let's have a look at, uh, at, at wages and, the, and in relation to talent from a cost perspective. So, so far we have all only looked to the external labor market, so the demand and supply, assuming that if you need somebody, you, you, you just go to the external labor market and you find somebody who can do the job for you. Well, in fact, that isn't always the case. You could also do something different. You could also hire somebody in the early stage of their career uh, for a lower uh, wage and then invest a lot in their training and development. And then someday 
these people will be ready to take on more serious jobs in the organization. So imagine the, the, uh, a lot of the, uh, of the large uh, uh, organizations that we know nowadays, for example Philips, um, they started a, a few decades ago, it was pretty normal that after your graduation you would join such an organization at a very low level and then you would work in some department here, you do go to engineering for a while, you would do sales and growing through the ranks at some point you would be ready to enter the highest levels of the organization and become the director of a, of a division or something. Um, there's huge benefits in this kind of approach to uh, talent development. Um, one very important thing is that you are uh, cutting on the costs for uh, recruitment and you're cutting on the costs for training if you hire people that are, well, go back to the example, if you hire somebody, if you're looking for somebody in this organization that is able to, to lead a division, um, and you hire such a person from the external labor market, this doesn't mean that this person is automatically aware of all the company procedures and of all the culture things and about the specifics of this kind of industry. So there's a lot of training needed to bring such a person in, into the right shape for, the, for leading a, um, a big company. If this person comes from inside, then the experience is already there and the, and the training costs are very, very much less. The same is for recruitment. Of course, if you hire somebody from internally, you don't need to hire um, to, to, do, to do business with an expensive headhunter or something. Um, so the idea is also that there's, since there's no training and um, Onboarding time needed, there's, so these people that are promoted are immediately productive and they can therefore have a productivity advantage. Um, and interestingly, if you recruit people in the organization to higher ranks, you don't have to compete on the external labor market. So that means that you can provide a little bit lower wages. You're not going external. You, you, you build on the loyalty of people who are already in the organization and therefore the, the reward is, uh, can be a bit less. So in terms of transaction costs, so transaction costs being the decision between either I, am I going to buy something externally or am I going to make something by myself and what is the most cost effect, effective, then there is a definite benefit in hiring people from inside the organization and moving them through the ranks, for example, by means of talent programs and things like that. There is, however, a downside to this uh, model. It, it, it sounds appealing, right? It, it sounds attractive if you, if, you, if you use your human resource management systems to, to develop a perfect work, uh, workforce within your organization and you don't need to go into the hassles with the uh, external labor market. Well, some of the downsides have been researched as well. So, especially in terms of hyperflexibility, in terms of uh, markets that change continuously, if you really need to quickly adapt your organization to, uh, uh, to the market, then um, this loyal and protected workforce actually hinders flexibility. If we look back to the 1980s, and I know it's a long time ago, but that was exactly what happened. There was a, an economic downturn, and uh, a lot of the big conglomerates like Philips, they were struggling with, uh, with the high costs of having a loyal and protected workforce, and they were not competitive on the inter inter uh, international market anymore. So they had to cut... Uh, they had to downsize their organizations considerably and it led to a lot of frustrations and a lot of um, pain, both in people and in organizations. We discussed this a little bit in chapter four when we talked about uh, uh, the dynamics of change in organizations. So there's pros and cons to internal labor markets. Um, the present perspective on internal labor markets is that it's actually good to invest in a core of workers, of employees who is uh, well trained and who is uh, prepared also to take the next step. So the make decision 
is still a valuable decision that can be used by organizations to create a good talent pool uh, in the organization. Um, but for those employees that can be easily replaced, it's easier to make a buy decision. So in many organizations nowadays, you see a combination of internal labor markets for the core workers. So those are typically employees that are harder to find on the external labor market or people that have a strategic value to the strategy of the organization. And then a, uh, a, a rank of flexible workers for jobs that are, well, you know, that all organizations have, it's easier to, easier to exchange. We have discussed this dynamics also in uh, chapter four when we talked about flexible organizations. So here you see the reasoning, the economic reasoning behind such models. It's a make or buy decision to have the right amount of people for what your organization is supposed to do with the right uh, knowledge, of course. So this brings me to the end of the economic theories. Uh, by now you know that compensation is central in economic theories and in the war for talent. Um, also you are introduced to the idea of the equilibri equilibrium wage, uh, which is part of the classic wage theory, but it's in, um, in reality hindered by loads of frictions in the labor market and policy. And well, we discussed this. Uh, efficiency wage theory is a more practical HRM theory which helps us understand why high wages have advantages. And then finally we discussed uh, trans transaction cost theory. Uh, we said what organizations need to do is to think about which part of their labor core is going to be invested in, is going to be made, and which part of the labor force is actually attractive to buy on the labor market, so don't invest in them too much. That's it. <laughs>